Hi, welcome to Nursing School Explained and today's video on blood transfusions. Please keep in mind that there's also another video that specifically goes over any possible adverse reactions to blood transfusions. And this video gives you a basic overview of the different types of blood products we can administer as well as to their indications and associated nursing care, which is always super important. So let's first look at what different types of blood products there are available. So over here, if a patient donates a unit of blood, it basically is considered whole blood. So that whole uh, blood the patient donors that goes into the bag is considered whole blood. Now in the lab, when it's prepared, we can basically distinguish between red, red cells as well as plasma. If you've ever worked at a lab or seen a lab, or um, done any kind of blood spinning, you know that the, through, in a centrifuge, when the, the blood separates, we have the red cells and then on top the liquid portion, the kind of yellow serum portion, which is also called the plasma. And the plasma contains three different uh, components, which are platelets, albumin, and cryoprecipitate. So we can really transfuse any one of these and also plasma as a whole, and then it would contain platelets of human as well as cryoprecipitate, or just each one of those. So let's look at those in more detail here. Uh, RBCs, or packed red cells, as they are many times referred to, are probably the most commonly transfused blood product. The indications would be anemia or acute blood loss, which is also a type of anemia, but um, keep in mind that also pertains to leukemia, any of the blood disorders, and um, any kind of acute blood loss that might occur. And one unit of blood typically contains between 20, 250 and 350 milliliters, and it has the ability to incre increase the patient's hemoglobin by about one gram per deciliter, so by about one point. Many times the rules at many hospitals are that the patient needs to have a transfusion once the hemoglobin drops below 7 or 8, depending on the overall circumstances. So as you can see, the patient, depending on if they are male or female, typically the normal hemoglobin level is anywhere between 12 and 16, so they could need multiple units to bring the level back up to where they should be. And one unit of red blood cells replaces about 500 milliliters of blood loss. And that is because it's not only the red cells that we're losing if we have an acute blood loss, but we're also having the plasma, which will then regenerate itself from the bone marrow. And for packed red cells, there is also a product called leukocyte reduction or a process that the blood can go through which decreases the adverse reaction for patients who do require frequent transfusions because of their specific medical condition. Now platelets um, are a part of the plasma as we can see over here, but the lab again can filter out only the platelets and the treatment uh, indication is thrombocytopenia, so low platelet count. And one unit of platelets can increase the platelets by about 5,000. And one donor can donate multiple units. The platelet bags usually are a lot smaller than the packed cells, maybe anywhere from 50 to 100 ml. Then we can also give the patient FFP, or fresh frozen plasma. And that now is that serum, that whole serum component from the whole blood. So it includes platelets, albumin, as well as cryoprecipitate and other minor things. And it is the liquid portion of the whole blood and it treats coagulation factor deficiencies because it uh, contains the cryoprecipitate and it is many times used in the emergency reversal of an elevated PT or INR when, uh, when that reversal is needed and when the patient has an increased risk for bleeding. So that, for example, might be a patient who is on an anticoagulant for whatever reason, and now they have a fall or a trauma and they require some sort of surgery. Uh, an example is a patient who is on Coumadin for atrial fibrillation, and now they have a hip fracture and they require surgery. Well, the breast frozen plasma replaces coagulation factors and the platelets 
that the anticoagulant kind of tries to um, modify and so by replacing it the patient will be ready for surgery sooner than they would if they would just be watchful waiting until the body regenerates their, um, their, their plasma portion and the coagulation factors that we want to make sure are within normal limits before we send them to the operating room. The other portion here that we can administer is albumin and albumin, keep in mind, is this plasma protein that helps pull the fluid or hold the fluid in the intravascular space. So albumin, about 25 grams per deciliter, equals 500 ml of plasma osmolarity because it has that ability to pull the fluid into the intravascular space. It causes a fluid shift from the extravascular or interstitial space into the intravascular space. And reasons that we need it is typically because the blood pressure is low, such as in hypovolemic shock, or any condition where the albumin level would be low. So patients with malnutrition, for example, patients with a lot of pitting edema because of congestive heart failure, if their albumin is low, and those kinds of um, disorders. And then the last component is cryoprecipitate, and that is the last component here from the plasma, from the uh, serum uh, section of the blood, and it replaces coagulation factors only. Most of the time it's used to replace factor 8, von Willebrand's disease, or fibrinogen. And the condition here specifically where we need to replace fibrinogen is DIC, or disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, which is a, a sequence of events that can occur due to multiple conditions and puts the patient in a very critical bleeding state. So then in order to give them these coagulation factors as well as the fibrinogen is going to be super important. Now, the other thing that I've brought up over here are recipients and donors. So what recipient can receive blood from what donor? And it goes from O, A, B, and AB blood types, and then we always have positive and negative RH factors. And um, so any letter can receive blood from their own letter, but remember that we cannot give a patient who is RH negative an RH positive blood product. So hence, O positive can receive O positive and O negative, but a patient who has O negative blood type can only receive O negative. Same with A. A positive can receive A positive and A negative, as well as O positive and O negative. A negative can only receive A negative and O positive, so no, uh, sorry, O negative, so no positive here. B positive can get both B types as well as both O types. B negative again only B and O negative. AB positive, they are the lucky ones, they are the universal recipient, they can receive all types of blood from any kind of donor and blood type. And then AB negative can basically have all of, all of the above except the AB positive because uh, it is a negative factor here. And then also in black, see what I've kind of uh, circled here, O negative is the universal donor. So that blood is usually a hot commodity. If you have O negative blood type, please consider donating blood because anybody can receive your blood in case there is an emergency or the need for that. So then over here, very important with blood transfusion is the nursing care and the precautions that we have to take. Now, policies and procedures may vary depending on what hospital you work at. And so always be familiar, be familiar with the policies and procedures of your specific um, hospital. These, some of those will, are universal, but some of them will depend on where you work. So first of all, when we, when we give a blood transfusion, we want to make sure that we have good IV access. We want to have a minimum of a 22 gauge IV, uh, many times, if there is acute, acute blood loss, let's say the patient who had a traumatic injury and is actively bleeding, a 22 gauge is not going to cut it. You're going to have to go larger, maybe an 18, maybe even a 16 or a 14 French um, uh, gauge um, IV access, so that the bigger the gauge, the more blood can go through there faster. So if there's a need for rapid infusion, you want to have a very large bore IV. Of course, we want to check the order and make sure that the physician or the provider has consented the patient for the blood transfusion. 
Uh, there's specific blood tubing available and the reason is that it has a filter because um, certain particles might get caught there and we certainly don't want to infuse those into the patient's blood, into the patient's vein. And it also has a wide tubing which will allow you to hang the blood bag as well as the normal saline at the same height so that you can then prime them. Um, we typically want to use a pump. Again, if this is acute blood loss and the patient needs many units of blood frequently, we're not going to use the pump. We're either going to let it free flow or even use a rapid infuser to be able to administer that blood fairly quickly. Um, we always want to double check the, the blood with a second RN. And you want to check the policies and procedure of your specific facility because some facilities now have the ability with their electronic medical record through barcode scanning and very meticulous checking of the system that you do not need to check with a second nurse, which is kind of uh, a little scary at first or a little different when you're used to always checking it with a second, second nurse, but it is possible. So be aware of your policies and procedures. The other thing that I didn't write down here, that's probably one of the most important things, we want to administer with normal saline only. And the reason is that the, any kind of other fluids such as um, D5 or LR can cause some precipitation with the blood and then we have a huge problem we can't use the blood unit the patient carries delayed or if it reaches the patient now they're getting an infusion of some um, precipitated or coagulated blood um, uh, once you pick up the blood from the blood bank at your hospital the requirement is to start within 30 minutes and that is pretty universal and the reason is that it comes out of the refrigerator and so it's only go just like food. You wouldn't leave food on your table forever before you eat it. You would um, administer the blood within 30 minutes and then also the other thing is the maximum infusion time is 4 hours and that again is for viability and make sure that it's still safe to do that. Use a rate that's appropriate for the patient. So again, if this is a traumatic event, acute blood loss, it's going to have to be going in quickly. But if this is a patient who just needs a transfusion for, let's say, a treatment of cancer, or they have a condition like uh, congestive heart failure or any kind of renal issues, we want to make sure we go a little bit slower because anything we put in the patient's, vas patient's vascular system might um, cause some heart failure and might the fluid, they might end up in fluid volume overload and it might settle in their lungs. So we want to be extra cautious here. And then for vital signs, we want to obtain a baseline set of vital signs, including a temperature that's very important. And then check the vitals again after 15 minutes of the start of the infusion. And then typically every 30 minutes to one hour, depending on your policy and procedure and the patient's um, status. And if an adverse reaction occurs, it typically occurs in the first 15 minutes. So you want to stay with your patient for the first 15 minutes, educate them about what you're doing and what kinds of signs and symptoms to watch out for. And that way you can intervene right away if something happens. And then watch my other video on the different kind of blood reactions that are possible, the adverse reactions, as well as what to do about them. Um, so you can see my different video about that. Thanks for watching this video on blood transfusions. Please subscribe, give me a thumbs up if you have enjoyed this video, and I'll see you soon right here on Nursing School Explained.